Welcome to Insight, today produced in collaboration with KCOS 13, El Paso Public Television. Today we are chatting with Emily Loya, the general manager of KCOS 13, El Paso Public Television. And Emily has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Emily, for joining us today. Well, thank you, Mark, for having me and for this partnership that we're in going about together. And mm -hmm. it's really fabulous because mm -hmm. we've been able to talk with so many different mm -hmm. nonprofits in the El Paso uh, greater metro region. Talk about serving a community like El Paso and its, its citizens and its, its various uh, different communities that make up this municipality. Yeah, well, um, I've been in El Paso 10 years now, so it's not home, but I'll call it home now. And uh, El Paso is a really unique place in the sense that it's a bicultural, binational region, really. It's not just El Paso. You can't have El Paso without Juarez. And really, Las Cruces is also all in that mix. So um, we're called the Paso del Norte region, and, um, and we really think of ourselves in those ways. I mean, of course, there's differences between the three cities, but um, there's the sense of we all are one big community, and we're mostly bilingual and where I go across the border every week and you know all these things and most a lot of people cross every day and so we're not just the US we're also Mexico and that's a beautiful thing in the sense that um, we get two cultures and we get the benefit of that but it's also can be a challenging in the public media space um, uh, we we're able to teach a lot of people English through our channel we're also able to bring a lot of culture that maybe isn't available across the border that people can enjoy with a lot of viewers in Mexico too but um the idea of supporting the fact that we're a public nonprofit television station doesn't always translate and also it's a community of great need um El Paso and Juarez um there is a high um poverty and low income rate that um isn't able to support public media financially. So we, the burden becomes a little heavier on those that can. And um, we don't have a lot of heavy, we don't have a lot of big corporations. You know, we have like two corporate headquarters in all of El Paso, which that makes a big difference on how all nonprofits are supported in our community. Um, but on the benefit side, we found that some entities are really interested in supporting things that are bicultural and that are on the border. So a lot of times PBS subgrants some community engagement out and we've been really successful in my time at KCOS in getting those community engagement grants around national programming to add local flavor, to add local engagement around them. And that's been really encouraging and a lot of fun. Um, for instance, we did that with, a few years ago with Shakespeare on the Rocks, a local group here um, that's a performing group. And we did Rome, Romeo and Julieta. So it was the Montague spoke English, <laughs> the Capulet spoke Spanish. We even took the, we did four performances, three in El Paso. We took one across the border to Uasajota and Juarez, the University of Ciudad Juarez. And um, we were able to do performance there and had over 400 people attend. So the response was really great. And it was a really cool community collaboration. So there's a lot of benefit too, not just the the challenges. And how many viewers are in your broadcast area on both sides of the yeah. border? So on the U.S. side, our DMA is 92. So it's the 92nd largest um, designated market area in the country. And that's 330 some households in El Paso, Las Cruces and surrounding areas. 330,000. 330,000. Yeah. Right. And so we have, that's just the U.S. side. So that's about, it's a, a million, a little over a million people in the estimate. But on the Mexico side, we serve, we reach almost another million and a half in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Even Cable Mas in Mexico picks up our channel and airs it, and also from the over-the-air signal. So, so it's is, really about 2.5 million. And this is really important because you have 2.5 million, but your funding comes from 1 million. Mm -hmm. And not only does your funding come from 1 million, but uh, because of the wealth distribution here in El yeah. Paso, it comes from a very, very small and dedicated community yeah. of funders. So you are punching way above your weight with your 10, yeah. 10 full-time staff and, and subcontractors. We're efficient, and volunteers. yes, and we swing and we swing hard for to do as much as we can with the resources that we have. And we do a lot of partnerships and collaborations. So um, we, we, you know, we can't do all things for everyone, but we focused on kids and family a lot. So we actually, um, we host two major events every year, our Kids Fiesta and our Be My Neighbor Day. And these are family festivals where we bring in um, local performing groups. We have lots of community organizations and businesses that serve families. So they're able to um, reach directly to those families. And also we, the big draw is a PBS Kids character, whether it's Daniel Tiger from the world of Mr. Rogers or, um, you know, different characters that we rotate for our Kids Fiesta. And we have thousands of families come out to each of these events. And um, 
our community is always looking for free and fun things to do with their families. And um, we make sure that we do that in partnership. You know, we couldn't cover all those costs if we paid everything cash out of pocket. So we partner with venues. We partner um, with our city in different ways. We partner with a lot of different um, corporations. So we're really fortunate to be able to do that so that we can keep things um, as low cost and free for those that are attending as well. So these are these are sponsored events. Mm -hmm. They they are sponsored, they are organized by you and yes. your staff. Mm -hmm. And then you partner with other organizations. It's it, Again, it's part of this, yeah. this really innovative entrepreneurial model mm -hmm. that led to this type of a partnership where oh, we yeah. get to together cover El Paso nonprofits and honor their work. Yeah. You're bringing community together and connecting them to your station, but also connecting them to each other and providing exactly. a service. Exactly. You know, and I feel like that, you know, my career started at United Way here in El Paso, and I feel like public media is the United Way of media in the sense that we're we're, we're we're there to be a partner with everyone, right? So we have good relationships with our commercial media partners, both on television, radio, and print. Um, we're not seen as a competitor, but we also, you know, are happy to connect with our um, nonprofit partners in the community because we also are a nonprofit. So we wish we could sometimes do even more for them, but we're like, we also have some limitations. But that's how we work with businesses to help cover the costs and make a little bit of profit off of our events so that we can invite nonprofit partners for free or just at cost for some of the bare minimum stuff so they can have those outreach numbers that they need for their grants and that direct content and also attract people to the services that they offer in our community. And they provide a lot of great educational hands-on activities for kids and families in our community at these events. And, and it's important to understand that this is working as a virtuous circle. So mm -hmm. every dollar that is cycled into mm -hmm. a local station like mm -hmm. that is actually there to be experienced by the community. Definitely. You're, you're, you're bringing in people who are dedicated to that type of service. And the commercial media has its own role. Of course, and, yeah. And the commercial media is is there to serve, um, serve other community interests and to make a profit for its mm -hmm. shareholders. You instead are trying to generate a profitable relationship mm -hmm. yeah. with the community, with, with each other and with itself. Yeah, and you know, I mean, this is there's a lot of changes in the media landscape, right? And one of the things that's really important is to make sure that we're differentiating what is our local value, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it's not there's content aspect to that, but there's also that engagement aspect. As this millennial, you know, I'm technically a millennial too, though I don't know that I always feel like it. But um, it's really people want experiences, not just the stuff anymore, right? So how do we, as a local media entity and nonprofit organization, provide those connections and those experiences, whether they're rich media experiences or in-person experiences. We do a lot too when there's content that especially resonates with the Latino community or around diversity. We work with UTEP or EPCC and other community partners to host community conversations, do a screening event, bring great panelists together, um, go deeper into content and expose um, community members to things that they may not have otherwise been aware of, and also to help create pride in our community. One of my favorite um, initiatives that we have at the station that connects both engagement and content is our filmmaker series called Only in El Paso. And um, we're in our fourth season now. So it's um, been a passion of mine since I got here to the station a little over four years ago. We partnered with the Convention and Visitors Bureau, Destination El Paso, that's their parent name. And they um, help promote our content. So it's local filmmakers, it's a competitive process, but it's people, places, and experiences you can only find in our region. And um, it, it's brought out stories, um, bio stories, individual, um, you know, visiting Waco tanks and seeing what it's really like. So it's a benefit to people that live here because often we don't even realize what we have in our own backyard. And it's also great for exposure for us as a community when people are looking to find out if they want to come here or what they're going to do when they come to El Paso. We have all these great short three-minute mini docs that people can see all these things we're really proud of in our, in our region. And some are in Spanish, too, and translated, and they're from Juarez as well as from El Paso. So, so you're, you're providing information out to the community, mm -hmm. but also to newcomers to the community like yeah. you once were. They say that the art is managing through constraints, mm -hmm. and this is certainly a constrained environment. Mm -hmm. So you, you have a, a very narrow budget, mm -hmm. and you have to make sure that the ends meet at the end of the year. How, do yeah. you, how does your fundraising work? Well, so we are fortunate to have a big diversity of funding. I think some, non having worked at other nonprofits too, sometimes they're very reliant on one or two major right. sources, right? Whether it's grant funding, um, both state or national or, or local funding as well. 
But so we have a portion of our funding is from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, um, which is about 40% of our funding. Um, but the rest of it comes all from locally related sources. We have a partnership with El Paso Community College on space. So that's a collaboration there that um, allows us to, to have a great venue without the hard costs of that. So you get 40% of your funding from, mm -hmm. uh, from the national organization. Mm -hmm. And then you you uh, benefit from cost avoidance on exactly. rent and so yeah. on. Yeah, and then we also, I mean, a quarter of a million dollars a year, more or less, in individual support through pledge drives and online giving and other creative ways. And then we also about a little over $100,000 a year in events. Um, right. We do an art auction. We do a gala. We're bringing in a new event this year as well that's um, called a Nerd Walk because everybody's a nerd for something at PBS and ha celebrating that nerd culture. And um, and then we have um, corporate underwriting, corporate support and sponsorships. So um, that's another hundred to hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of support as well. So um, and then we also have some some production partnerships where there's some contracts along there too. So we have a lot of opportunity to grow in each of those areas. Um, and we've we've and then grants as well. So when I got here there were zero in additional grants. We weren't doing, you know, private grant funding in any way and we've grown that to between seventy and a hundred thousand dollars each year as well. So um, so there's still a lot of room for growth but um, but it's nice that we can play to different strengths and to and adapt to the community because it's not like we only have one or two pockets where we can do funding. Plus, you're you're forging as we as we said these types of partnerships where you mm -hmm. get in kind contributions. Yes. Where, mm -hmm. when you have your events, mm -hmm. you try to negotiate some some way to get. So mm -hmm. you're you're kind of a hard nosed business negotiator. I mean, you got you, you got and I us here, love right? It, right? Yeah. <laughs> so um, I think that's really fun, and that's like one of the beauties of this role and being a community licensed station in the sense that we have a lot of um, ability to to adapt and to um, to make things work and be collaborators in our community and do the things that make sense. Um, and that changes over time um, as needs arise, and also you know as we get certain special funding for a project or different pieces, our community connections serve us well because we can say, we want to write you into this grant or we want to work collaboratively in this because we have that trust, um, not just at the national level of the quality of content from PBS, but that, we've, PBS, but that we've built that trust in our own community through these partnerships and through these ongoing things that we do um, to serve. So given that, that you're on the border, you have 2.5 uh, million in your broadcast mm -hmm. area on both sides of the border, only a million within the United States, and the fact that uh, El Paso is not the richest community in the nation. Mm -hmm. And so you have a very, very narrow uh, base of uh, financial yeah. support mm -hmm. locally. How do budget cuts in the United States uh, for national public media mm -hmm. affect you? Well, they're, you know, the budget that we receive from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting is crucial to our service, and not just us, but so many smaller and marginalized communities across the country. So um, when you look at how that's distributed, it's a complicated formula and all of that, but they try to make sure that local um, smaller communities or um, poorer communities like ours, um, they know that our percentage is higher on the national side. And um, that's that, that in those cases, if the funding was cut, you know, almost all of those stations would not be able to find a pathway to survival in the, in the time frame for when the funding would ramp down, right? And that would be such a loss for our communities and for public storytelling all across the country, right? PBS stations tell local stories that wouldn't be heard and um, wouldn't be covered in so many ways, and radio stations, and the local radio stations as well. Um, you know, a few would still survive. Some of the biggest ones on the coast would be able to, if, you know, if federal funding went away, next year, um, then they would be able to survive. But a lot of people would really struggle and the burden would become heavier on those that do survive because the total cost for programming would still remain the same. And um, so they would just have bigger pieces of the pie. So we're, you know, we do, we work really hard to work with our, our viewers, our constituents um, and our Congress people to understand the value of public media beyond just the signal on the channel. Um, but to talk about our work in education and um, how many folks and, and little ones are reached through the early childhood education. That's a really unifying thing across both party lines. And also our work in public safety and, um, and in journalism on a national level being bipartisan, but, but especially what we do for kids and, and serving families in that way that um, is not political. In I, also, I also think that, that if you look at commercial media, mm -hmm. Commercial media is aligned to advertising interests. Mm -hmm. 
which are really about uh, business. And the businesses that are most profitable yep. are going to advertise the most. Nonprofits have zero profit. Mm -hmm. Symphonies have zero profits. Museums have zero profits. Yeah. And frankly, uh, the social services that are so often provided to people in need, they're zero profits. Smaller businesses that are being incubated have zero profits. So you basically create a embedded gap mm -hmm. of, of coverage and sensibility if you just have commercial media. doesn't mean that commercial media uh, is, is bad or terrible. It has its place, and it is a dominant place. Yeah. There is a tiny, tiny, tiny little sliver that is public media. Yeah. And the and the tiniest of slivers that is public media really is funded on a shoestring. Yeah. And if that shoestring is cut, how do you how do you lace up your shoe if you have half a shoestring? Exactly. No, the the federal funding is really important and it's really interesting to think about it's a dollar 35 per American, you know, and in Canada it's 30 some dollars per Canadian. And in, in the UK, you know, public media is like $240 per television set or something like that. So when people wonder why our content is different or we don't have the volume of content on a national level, well, it, it does go back to the funding pattern, right? You know, and um, even, I mean, our, even what our national funding is, is a very small chunk compared to other countries too. So we believe it's a good investment. And it's $1.35 for American. Mm -hmm. for, for radio and TV. For radio and TV for every year. Yeah, and then that's leveraged, you know, um, I think the average is, that's only about 15% of all the total funding that's brought to, pu to the public media landscape. So um, those dollars are leveraged over and over again to get additional local support, but they are crucial, you know, backbone dollars that um, wouldn't make it possible in smaller or um, lower income communities And like there's ours. no profit associated with that uh, mm -hmm. Dollar thirty-five for all, anyone. Yeah, it's all reinvested. Mm -hmm. What do you think the future is going to be for public broadcasting? We we are constantly hearing year after year mm -hmm. in Washington these these desires to cut funding mm -hmm. for public broadcasting. Um, we have the internet that mm -hmm. beca has become another source mm -hmm. of news. Now you don't actually have to turn on your public uh, broadcasting mm -hmm. station to get the national programs. Yeah. Uh, what do you think the future is going to be for these various uh, local stations that are so important to their local communities? It's a great question. We're still living in it. And if somebody had the exact answer for this is what it's going to be, I think they'd be leading, you know, they'd be leading and making that change completely. But um, I would say that, again, I think it's on the engagement side. How do we go beyond media? Because the sense is that there's so much information out there, but we still form habits and go to places where there's trusted sources. So how do we continue to leverage the trusted brand that we are even in that digital space? And how do we, you know, PBS has often been an innovator. And I think we, um, we are innovating in some ways, but we need to continue to be on that leading edge in innovation in the way that we engage our audience and the way that we tell more local stories and bring in other local storytellers, even if they're not staff from our stations, right? right? And how do we provide that platform and, um, and the world is changing really quickly. So we have to work really hard in that space. But I also think it's that engagement piece, like the beyond the screen. You'll see that in other media entities, commercial media entities, uh, you know, like local newspapers are hosting more local events so that people still want that real personal experience, but that local brand makes people want to come out and have that value. Um, when is the end of TV? I don't know, right? You know, the end of radio has been predicted for forever and ever, and so has TV for a while. Um, it is different because it's on demand now and we have to figure out how we do those revenue, revenue sources even better. Um, and public media is not so nimble sometimes in those ways because we have some limitations with right. the FCC as well as we just don't have the same investment level for the technologies needed sometimes. So, um, but I do think it's that engagement piece, the face-to-face, -face, the interactive experience side and then still compelling local content even on a digital platform. So maybe it's a combination of curatorial mm -hmm work. In other words, yeah. you're curating content because mm -hmm. you are the trusted. And, and in order to be the trusted provider, you have to know your community. So yeah. that's an element as mm -hmm. well, knowing your community, then engaging your community and being mm -hmm. a vehicle for the joy of, of the community and engaging with mm -hmm. you and engaging with others, uh, being an intermediary. Yeah. Um, all these different elements can't actually be purchased. They have, mm -hmm. to, be, they have to be created by mm -hmm. human capital. Yeah. By, by, by people with the sensibility that you, you know, have. And that and team is so important. I think that's been my one of my most important roles is not just 
building the team here locally, both those that have been here on our team like for a long time and bringing in new folks that have either come back to our community or come from another industry or part of the nonprofit world to really build that family and team that we have here, but also those community partners and connections. So it still is ultimately all about relationships, right? But, um, but you can get a lot more done um, through those partnerships and through building a great network of ambassadors and team members who really help us. Well, Emily Loya, this has been so much fun talking to you about public media and the mm -hmm. future of public media in El Paso. Thank you so much for, for sharing with us all this knowledge and all this experience, and thank you so much for your insights. Well, thank you, Mark.